Oh. This went live faster than I was expecting to. Uh, welcome to today's uh, stream. I'm intending on covering clustering algorithms, specifically the UPGMA and uh, the tree data structure, which is a pretty uh, ubiquitous data structure in a lot of programming. I'm feeling completely noob for that starting up right away. It's probably because I was moving around windows and stuff like that. Um, anyways, sorry for the wait. Uh, the only issue that I have is because of the length of the material that we covered yesterday. Uh, trying to see if my, my green shirt is going to get... Nope. Because um, I got a green screen behind me. If I have the green shirt, I was just trying to see if that would go invisible. I don't know. Uh, sorry, I digress. Because of the length of yesterday's stream talking about uh, hidden Markov models, uh, I didn't really get a whole lot of time devoted strictly into solving the UPGMA uh, problem. And uh, hopefully I can kind of describe the overarching goal of UPGMA uh, for hierarchical clustering. Other than that, please ask any questions you want uh, in the chat. I'll be watching. So. Uh, Hopefully this is some use to you. So again, if you didn't know, uh, my name is Marcus. Uh, I'm one of the graduate student instructors for a, uh, I'm really out of it yesterday, took it out of me. I'm one of the graduate student instructors for Bioinformatics 529, Bioinformatic Algorithms and Concepts for the Department of Computational Medicine and Bioinformatics at the University of Michigan. These office hours were created initially just to help people understand some of the concepts that we're trying to go over in class a little bit more in depth and allow them to do things at their own pace should they feel it necessary to. Uh, I'm never really trying to cover anything that will dramatically help them on the exam, so to speak. I'm not going to be giving them answers ahead of time. But the purpose of today is to uh, actually cover a topic that I don't really know a whole lot about for myself. Uh, Programming-wise, it's a fun problem. It's a fun data structure, but I haven't really messed around with it a lot. And that's mainly because of this concept that we are going to be applying called recursion. And the people that are in the class that I help teach are going to be going over recursion methods and recursion recursion searching uh, later on in the course, almost exactly after they get back from spring break. So I'm going to be covering one of the topics that our class just recently covered, which is UPGMA. Anyways, to get into that, let's go straight into uh, creating our notebook. And the first part of the notebook that I'm really going to be concerning myself with is the uh, distance matrix compilation step. And uh, for those of you in the class, this is, you guys have already covered this when we talked about Hamming distance. Now, uh, Hamming distance is just a one for one count across two different sequences or whatever to determine the number of differences between the two. So you're actually counting up how dissimilar something is. So when we were talking about a distance matrix, you may hear it as a dissimilarity matrix, or the inverse of that is a similarity matrix, meaning lower scores are more similar. They're all analogous to each other. And this is actually a super simple process to understand or, or to actually implement once you've figured out what these functions do. So the very first thing I'm going to do is show you a very rudimentary uh, Hamming distance. And like I said, Hamming distance is just me copying uh, or me counting, summing up the differences letter for letter between the two sequences. So for me to do that, all I'm going to do is def 
hamming. And again, we covered this in the class, but for those of you that are not in the class, this is how I would do it. I'm gonna say left and right, and these are just saying the two different sequences. Now it could be top and bottom, no matter which way you wanna think about it, and that's fine. If you wanna think uh, top and bottom, meaning if you're stacking these on top of each other and then just iterating one at a time, uh, that's one way to think about it too. And the Hamming distance, there's two different ways of thinking about Hamming distance. And one is the simplest way, which is this. And that's just, I'm gonna write it out verbosely and then make it into one concise line. So we have to iterate through both sequences at the same time. And our control structure for that is zip. So I'm gonna say for um, uh, T and B in zip, top and bottom. And now what this is going to do is uh, put both of those in at the same exact time and then iterate through them at the exact same time. So two different sequences of iter or iteratable sequences are actually linked together uh, or they're synchronized. So uh, in here, we're gonna say, I'm gonna go letter for letter between the top and the bottom. And now I'm just going to say, uh, let, let's have some count here. And again, I'm being verbose for, per, uh, for reasons. I'm gonna say sums equals zero. And I'm gonna say if T is not equal to B, then sums plus equals one. And then at the end of this, I'm just gonna say return sums. Now again, I'm trying to really state that this is extremely verbose. However, I can make this more concise and actually all in one line by using a generator expression within, uh, within the sum. So I can just say, so don't worry about this stuff. Let's just go here and just say return. And then we're gonna say sum. And now what sum's gonna do is it automatically consumes whatever we want. So if I say A equals range 10 or uh, list range 10 or whatever. I say A is this. And we look at A, it's going to give us these series of numbers. Well, sum will always consume everything that's inside of it. It'll automatically iterate through whatever's inside of it. So we can leverage that same ability here by saying, and let's go through our for loop, 4T B in zip top bottom. Now let's add our predicate, if t is not equal to b, and now what are we going to return? We're just gonna return one. And all this does in a single line is all that other for loop, and it does it really quickly. And that's a perfectly valid function. So I'm gonna pull up some example sequences that we were given in class. And the, uh, the sequences, uh, those of you that already have these available are just, they're just plain generic uh, pre-aligned sequences, meaning we're making the assumption, one of the assumptions of the Hamming distance is that all the sequences that it's being fed are of equal length. And we're assuming that they've already been uh, aligned properly. So here, anytime you see these uh, hyphens or dashes, that means there was a gap in the alignment, but you can see that these are all the same length. And I can go through any one of these and check the Hamming distance. So I'm gonna say Hamming alignments one and alignments two. And it shows me the differences between one, that's this position, and two. And that ch change is just right here, this A goes to a T. So that's all the Hamming distance is. Now there's a variant of Hamming distance that some people uh, use, specifically the SciPy package, and it's more of a normalized, so I'm gonna call this norm Hamming. And the idea is we're gonna take that sum and then since we're assuming the sequences are of equal length, I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna divide that sum by the length of either one of those. And if this is, if this were, if this, sorry, if you do this correctly, it should give you, oh, I spelled it wrong. It should give you a floating point number. That's all this is. 
So if you see some uh, libraries that do Hamming distance that ends with just a integer and others that depend on the length of the sequence, that's up to you. They're pretty much one and the same. Just this one takes, in, takes into account the length of the sequence. And that way you can actually compare, say you do a Hamming distance over a series of sequences, like we have here, we get the Hamming distance for all these. And then we have another, another set of sequences that are different lengths. If we control for the length of the sequence uh, using this right here, we can actually compare the two lists against each other. So now they're, instead of apples to oranges, they're apples to apples. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. Now, as much as this Hamming, and uh, I'll... I'll leave the norm hamming here, it's no big deal. But the point of this is, is as much as this is super easy for us to do, there's actually, when we get into more complicated metrics like Levenstein and phonetic differences, and that's just with strings, um, when we're talking about these different uh, types of text distances, uh, we may not want to write all those up. So uh, if you just go to your uh, to your terminal and do a conda, let's clear this, a conda install, and it's called text distance. And I'll, while my thing's doing that, I'm going to pull up text distance and send that link here. Uh, yeah, text distance. And the great thing about the PyPI text distance I'm going to go straight to its home page. Pop this in the chat. The great thing about this text distance module is it gives access to a lot of different text distance metrics than just hamming. And there's like 30 different text distances that this thing provides. Uh, Hamming distance, Levenstein, uh, Damro Levenstein, Jero Winkler, uh, Gateau, and that's just edit based. They have token based, sequence based, uh, compression based. They have a lot of different text metrics here, uh, text algorithm, de uh, text difference algorithms inside this library. So it's very well supported, it's very well uh, maintained. So why write it yourself outside of just trying to learn the idea behind uh, text distances? So going back to Jupyter Lab, we're just going to import text, uh, or we're going to import from text distance, import, and I'm just going to say hamming. It's perfectly fine, does the same thing as my other one does. So let's play around with that. I'm going to say hamming. I'm going to rename mine here, my hand. I don't want to clobber the namespace. Um, so I'm going to say hamming and alignments one versus alignments two. So they gave me the same exact thing. So this is text distances version of text distance. Um, and it gives us the same exact thing that we were expecting. Now, they have so many more, like I said, we can say uh, import text distance, and then dir text distance. And you'll see, here's all the different, not the, the leading underscore ones, but here's a bunch of the different algorithms that it has access to, like Smith-Waterman. Uh, that's like a big wink to anybody in 529. They have Smith Waterman. They also have Needleman Wunsch. Those could be particularly helpful in trying to get an idea of how some of these algorithms may work or the differences between them. Um, but we could play with uh, a bunch of them. So let's see this Levenstein. And I'm just going to replace this here, that hamming, and I'm going to say text distance dot uh, Levenstein. And it give us the same distance, and we can keep messing around with these all we want. And I could say bag. Uh, obviously, there's not going to be a big difference between a lot of these. 
that's a jacquard algorithm it's token based i don't know how that works i'm just showing you that it's here yes so one of the things that we're going to be dealing with in making these trees uh, or clustering these items are uh, grouping similar items to each other and if we're doing it sequenced base i'm just going to look through this set of sequences real here real quick here and we're going to point like i'm going to point out that there may be an issue with some of these sequences when it comes to trying to make unique elements so uh if you look at this list generally speaking all of these are pretty much different from each other however this item and this item are exactly the same. Now, I don't know if you can hear this, but my dogs are throwing a conniption fit in the background. So I'm sorry if you hear their barking. Uh, I'm guessing my wife is. Anyways, uh, these two sequences are identical. Now, the issue that this causes is if we're creating some trees, uh, a hierarchical clustering, some of the algorithms that are already out there that are super well optimized for this kind of analysis expect that each item or le each leaf of the tree uh, is unique or has some unique identifier. So if we're planning on ident like looking at, uh, sorry, clustering these based off their similarity, things that are identical in sequence are going to have identical labels. So we're going to have some issues there. So uh, I'm just creating, I'm going to create a quick program. Like it's easy enough for me to go in here and go, oh, okay, this one is the slash one and this one is slash two. That's fine. However, you aren't always going to have access to the data directly like this, specifically when you're talking about extremely large data sets. That's not helpful. And going in there and hand jamming any of that code is really, really a bad idea. So we can kind of overcome this. Let's move my top. I can overcome this by, I want to make sure my chat's up. We can overcome this by uh, creating a function that is going to handle that kind of automatic processing and labeling for us. So I'm going to bring in another import. And it's going to be from the standard library, so you don't need to install anything. And I'm going to say from collections import counter. Now, this is a special type of dictionary that as you add items to the dictionary, instead of actually storing each individual item, it actually just keeps track of the number of times you've seen that particular item. And defaults to zero for anything that hasn't been observed. And I'm going to use that uh, to create this uh, make IDs function. So def make IDs, and I'm just going to give it a series of alignments. Let's copy and paste some of my doc strings, so I don't have to do it later. And all we're going to do is we're going to get unique identifiers for each alignment in the list. And it, what it's going to create are these IDs, so potentially modified list of alignments. Now, the reason I say potentially here is because there's the, oh, there is the chance that every sequence is unique and it doesn't need to modify any. So I'm going to say IDs equals a list and then the counts equals a counter. And this counter is just going to keep track of everything. So I'm going to say for alignment in alignments. So now I'm going to iterate through each of them. I want to keep track of keep track of observed. And to do this, I just say counts.update, and then I give it an item. And it has to be like a dictionary-like item uh, because it's a dictionary. So all you have to do is wrap it in these brackets. And you just say, I'm going to add it this alignment to the dictionary. And now we're getting to the case, like what happens when it finally sees an alignment that it's seen twice or more? So to capture this, we're going to say if, whoops, uh, so the non-uniques. If counts alignment is 
greater than one. So remember, counts is just a dictionary. And what the counter does is it'll, we just look up a specific key in there and it just pops out the number of how many times we've seen that. So if it's greater than the one, that means that we've seen it more than once. So if this happens, I'm going to say IDs dot append, and I'm going to add this item to the list. Now I'm going to do some string formatting because I like string formatting. And we're going to add that alignment. And then I'm going to add the uh, counts alignment. Now, so what this means is it's going to take that alignment, add it to this list, but it's also going to append, uh, append to the very end, this slash, and then the counts, how many times it's been seen up till now. Now, an issue with this is, uh, for the sake of uh, convention, is that this will number every item after the first unique item. Well, this is bad because we want that first non or we want that first uh, non unique item to be readily apparent to us as well. So the way we can kind of do this is just to say, uh, let's go back. Let's go see if we can find that uh, exact same alignment. So uh, try and we want to look backwards and it's going to look for the first occurrence. And you'll see this in a second. I'm going to say IDs and then IDs. Uh, dot index and the index function takes um takes some key and it looks inside this list so it's an o of n it's a linear uh it looks inside the list to fee see the very first occurrence of that item in the list so if we haven't changed that item yet we're going to get some error um but if we haven't changed it I can go back and I'm going to change that directly in place. I'm going to say, uh, take this alignment and I'm going to append that with a slash one. So now the very first non-unique uh, case of this uh, will be counted or will be appended so it follows the same naming convention. Uh, now this try except is to say, okay, what happens if that if that alignment isn't into the dictionary anymore? Meaning we've already taken care of that. We're just going to do this try except block. Uh, this is the idea of duct typing. We're just making an assumption. It's easier to ask for for forgiveness than it is for permission. So here we're going to just say IDs. Oh, pass here. We don't want to do anything. And then break out of our loop. Oops. And now I'm going to say otherwise, if we if it's still unique and it's the first time we've seen it, we just want to append them directly to list. And then at the very end, we're just going to return this set of IDs. So to see this in action, if you look this at these alignments that we've already created up here, and I want to see this uh, directly in action. I'm just going to say make IDs, IDs equals make IDs alignments, and then I'm going to print it out. And you'll see that it printed these out. Let's type it this way. Maybe it'll. Anyways, it'll print it out, and you'll see that this item, the first item and the third item, were identical. So now we see that the first item and the third item now have that appended uh, tag to them that makes them unique. Um, this is actually the same kind of naming. I'm doing this. This is not something special in the field. This is just me. I, but this is mirrored after looking at uh, fast A files and SAM files, uh, SAM BAM files, because when you have read pairs, they tend to, if they have this, uh, kind of notation it usually indicates this is read one of the read pair and read two of the bit. Anyways, I digress. So the whole point of this is to uh, get our identifiers. So we have our alignments, we have our identifiers, and we have a means to get distances. So the 
last part, I'm going to show you the last part of figuring out the distance matrix step. It's actually crazy easy to do this, and I'll do it the first, the my way first. Um, and then I'm going to show you uh, libraries that have already done it in place. So <clears throat> I'm going to go back to my hamming up here, and I'm going to add a nether function in this cell. And I'm going to call this def distance metrics. And all it's going to take is some alignments and then metric. And so metric is saying, how am I going to define the distance between them? So it's going to be taking in a function. But I'm going to need something for this to work. And we're going to bring in my friend here from Ader Tools import product. And that just gives us the ability to mess around with uh, product again. So uh, the fun of product is for x, y, z in product um, a, c, g, t, a, c, come on, a, c, g, t, and a, c, g, t. print x, y, z. This, if anybody's in the biology realm, is a one-liner for us to get all of the codons. That's all product does, is it goes through and gives us all possible combinations. So it'll go through the first one, and then it'll go through the second one, and then iterate. It's just like a nested for loop. That's all it is. So product, again, I'm just highlighting product on how concise it is. So the other way you could say is 4x in... ACGT. I'm going to, instead of typing ACGT, just say NTZ. ACGT. And then for X in NT, for Y in NT, for Z in NT, print XY. It does the same thing. Uh, however, this is so much more line so many more lines than i personally would like so i can do that same thing here and just condense that whole thing to a very very simple one-liner to print out all of those codons and it's super helpful anyways Uh, so now that we have this product, the idea is, is we need to go through each of the items uh, in the alignments, and it's an all versus all. We need to compare everything against everything to figure out uh, this distance matrix. So we can look at a distance matrix as two ways. Uh, I'm going to do it my way first, and then I'll explain what the other way is very easily after that. Um, so first I'm going to create my d distance matrix and I'm just creating some uh, placeholders with NumPy zeros. And I guess I have NumPy here too. Uh, import NumPy as there we go. NumPy zeros. And the length of my distance matrix, if you think about it, if it's an all versus all, it's a perfectly square matrix. However, I don't really care about the square matrix. I'm only going to deal with just the upper half. Uh, this is called the uh, upper triangle or the lower triangle, whichever way you want to think about it. I'm only going to be dealing with part of the computation because uh, the way that works is if it's a perfectly square matrix and it's all versus all, that means that this square matrix is perfectly symmetrical, meaning that there's a duplication of data. And if you're working with sufficiently large data sets, that could be a tremendous amount of computation. Doing everything, even though you've already done it once, doing everything is kind of a pain. So I'm only going to do part of it. So here I'm just going to say the length of the alignments times two. So I'm just going to double the length of the alignments, which in this case is five. So then this will be a one dimensional array of zeros. And I'm going to say alignment count equals zero and a uh, con count equals zero. And now for alignment 
in alignments. Okay. Uh, we're going to say the sub align is equal to the alignments and align plus one to the end. So here we're saying we're going to pull out all the sub alignments of. So we're pulling out one and then everything to the right of it. And then we'll pull out the next one and everything to the right of that. And then the next one and everything to the right of that. That's all this is doing iteratively. Now we use our fun uh, product. Uh, so for left, and I'm going to say I write in product alignment. And the reason I'm putting alignment in brackets is because I just want product to iterate over and over and over again over the same thing. If I didn't use brackets, it was actually it'll actually iterate over each letter, and I don't want that. Um, and then enumerate, and this should be the subalignments. I want to uh, enumerate everything to the right of that item in the list, and I want it to start at con count uh, plus one. Now. You'll, I'll explain what each of these steps are doing in a little bit. I'm just trying to get the lines on paper. So then we say DM for the distance matrix, uh, I minus one is equal to whatever our metric chooses to use. So this could be Hamming, Levenstein, whatever. Left. Right. Um, and then after we're done with the iterations, after we've looped through everything, that's what this else does. So here's our for loop. And once we've successfully done that sort uh, that for loop, gracefully, we want to do some finishing action. So, excuse me, where we've done if else and if elif and else, you can actually do for and else and then while and else, meaning that after the loop is finished, do these additional cleanup actions. And here we're saying after it's gone through each of the sub alignments, then I want to increase my con count to plus equal one. And then I want to increase my alignment count plus equals one. And then return. Yeah. Okay. So let's actually see this in action and we'll play around with this. I'm going to move these. We're done with this. Okay. So now that I have my hamming distance and I have the distance matrix, all I have to do is say DM equals distance matrix and I'm going to give it those alignments I've already worked with and then some metric. So I'm going to say my uh, hamming. Spelled something. Oh. Alignment. Alignment. Got it. Okay. This is the fun of it. This is where we actually go. We went from computing an entirely uh, square uh, matrix. Instead of computing an entirely square matrix, all we're computing now is just the upper half of the matrix, the upper triangle. Now, this is an issue when we look. Wow. Why? I think some of my numbers are off. That should be right. Let's just try right. There we go. I had a number off. This bright light, I don't think I could see where the plus or the minus was. Anyways. Um, so the idea is, 
the upper triangle is significantly less computation because we're doing less cells. It makes sense. We're not even dealing with the diagonal anymore because the diagonal, when it's self versus self, the distance will always be zero. So it doesn't do any good for us to actually compute that. So what this is doing is this is going across all of them and then computing these. So this is what in the world of uh, bio or in the world of matrix computations, matrix math, this is called a condensed form, uh, a condensed form matrix. And that's just because we can make certain um, assumptions about the matrix in this form. And if we know what the dimension of this, of the original form was, like how many rows were in the matrix, we can actually convert this to square form rather easily. So uh, to see this in action, I'm going to say from scipy dot spatial dot distance import square form. And what this allows me to do is easily convert uh, so you can see what the distance matrix looks like in square form. So here's the condensed form and there and we're and this is where I'm going to highlight why uh, you can do it cell by cell. You just be doubling the information. Self versus self, everything is zeros across the diagonal. So alignment one versus alignment one is zero. Alignment two versus alignment two is zero, so on and so forth. However, if I bring these uh, alignments down here, here it's saying alignment one versus alignment two, there's a one item difference. Boom. Okay. And then I can say alignment one versus alignment two or alignment three, there's a zero item difference. And that's because these two are the ones that are identical. And then we say uh, alignment three, and we can keep on going through this just like all versus all. Now, to see the specialness of this of how my calculation works up here is what I'm doing is I'm creating just a one dimensional array. Okay. There's nothing special about this, but when I start keeping track of my alignment and my con count, uh, con count, I did this in the middle of the night. So I don't, I remember why I called this con. Yeah. Version count. Um, the idea is, is I'm taking that alignment, iterating through each of the alignments, and then the sub-alignment. So if I'm taking the very first alignment, this one, uh, so alignment one, if I'm going to compare that against everything else and I don't care about itself, I only care about these items. So that's why I do this step here. I look at my alignment count and I pull everything to the right of it. So that's why I say plus one and then everything to the right. And then when we move to the next alignment, because then I'm going to I'm going to compare against all these other sub alignments. That's what the sub alignment is. When I get to the next one, I'm going on this row alignment two versus everything. Well, it's already compared against alignment one. So I don't need that and I don't need to compare against itself again. So I only need two and then everything to the right of it. And then three and then four and you get this condensed form. So this ignores the uh, the diagonal. Super, super helpful. The problem with this is, is this is how people tend to think of square form uh, distance matrices are the way that people tend to think of identifying this information. And even if you go online to the UPGMA wiki uh, where they explain this, the actual writer of that uh, demonstrates everything using square form matrices. I found a flaw in there. I guess it's not a flaw. It's an assumption of the uh, algorithm. But nonetheless, the point is, this could be potentially computational heavy when you're comparing lots of sequences against a lot of sequences. So working in this condensed world is computationally more efficient. There's this big problem, though, in that how do you get the index of like with regards to what we're doing today, how do we get the index of this minimum place, this minimum score? Yeah, it's easy for me to just say 
and I want just that DM, dm.min, and it's going to tell me it's zero. And then I can say argmin, and it'll tell me what index does that minimum value occur. That's super helpful, but that doesn't tell us in the grand scheme of all of these alignments. We know where this zero is, but how do we know what that zero compares against? Because remember, it compares two alignments to each other. So we have to get, and a lot of square form people want to use that, we have to get the first alignment that it's comparing against. So in this case, it's this row, and then the second alignment, so it's this column. So this will be alignment one, and then alignment uh, three. So how do we get that out? DM argmin isn't working, and uh, DM min isn't working. It's just telling us that there is a minimum value. It doesn't make actually any translational information to us, make any sense to us. Um, we can do this by looking at the square form of the DM. This is a square form DM, but when we put it into, into square form, we get this diagonal. Now, there are other like NumPy diags, um, diag indices from this, and we can actually uh, turn the indices. Oh, it's just telling us what the size of it is. So I'm just going to say uh, square form dot shape zero. And these will give us the two dimensional uh, indices of this. So then I can just say, uh, make this easy, dm square. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say dm square, and then everything in those brackets, all these indices, I'm going to set them equal to np, sorry, float, and uh, so if we look at this now, you'll see that the diagonal is no longer all zeros. So when I'm doing argmin, it's going to pull out. It's not going to see those. Uh, infinites, or it's not going to see those diagonals anymore. And I don't have to do that by hand. Um, so now let's look at this and say arg min. And let's look at the function. It's saying axis and out. It returns the indices of the, of the minimum values along a given axis. axis. So here it's saying that uh, two, let's say axis equals one. That's not a super lot of help. Axis equals two or axis equals zero. That's not a, a ton of help. Um, it actually can be, it's straightforward to get these, but I'm trying to show you that, yes, NumPy will make it very simple for me to get the uh, indices out. Let's see what I have. Arg. Just saying two. I'm not. Okay, so I think it's telling me it's here. It's not giving me the first one. I don't know. I'm not going to worry about this. I went at this a different way uh, simply because I'm always trying to keep things as efficient as possible for me. So, um, I created a function based off some stuff that I read online about how to convert a uh, condensed form matrix and get the indices out 
from it. So it's just a fun function. It's just a lot of quadratic equations, just basic algebra stuff. But the finished product is to get the index based off the dimension of a specific matrix, condensed form matrix. So here we're just saying the offset, and since this is quadratic, remember offset is just uh, B, right? So I'm going to say 1 minus 2 times the dimension of the, of the matrix, and then X equals NP dot floor. The negative of the offset minus NP dot square root. And offset eight index divided by two. So if you look at that, just kind of squint your eyes a little bit. That's like the uh, quadratic equation: negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus four ac all over. 2a, right? So then y equals idx uh, plus x times the offset, f times the offset uh, plus x plus 2 divided by 2. And then we're just going to return x. Okay, so the idea here is we already have this distance matrix and we want to know what the index in square form world of where this uh, minimum value is. So I can just say dm dot uh, arg min and this will tell me that this is in the oneth position, the oneth index. So that gives me the index of the one that I care about, right? So now that I have that, I can just put this into the condense index function. And then I'm just going to tell it what the dimensions of the, uh, the original matrix was. And that's just the length of the alignments. And here it's telling us that this is the zeroth uh, alignment. So maybe I just need these as ints because they're just indices. Readability sake. Here we're saying that if this is the zero alignment uh, versus the second alignment. So when we look back here, this is zero and then this is two. And those ones have the lowest value. If you look back up here, this is zero right here. And then this, this column is two. That's where the zero lies. So this is how I can quickly get those uh, minimum alignment or minimum distance indices out of a condensed form matrix, uh, thus speeding up a lot of the calculation when it comes down to the UPGMA. Now we get into the trouble spot where I just, I ran out of time, I ran out of understanding, there's some weird bug going on and I'm fully uh, happy to tell people that I am flawed when it comes as a programmer, especially with new concepts. I uh, underestimate how much time I need to deal with this. So I started working on this last night, and I'll show you what I got. Uh, in class, we have talked about the UPGMA, and the way that was given in the instruction, or at least the initial way that the instructor that created the class for UPGMA uh, decided to tackle the problem, their initial knee-jerk reaction, was to do a series of, uh, of NumPy matrices. Not so much a series, iterating through it and then constantly uh, removing or deleting a column out of it and then catenating a new column as the each iteration step of the UPGMA happens. Uh, this is perfectly uh, adequate. Like th There's nothing wrong with that outside of me constantly thinking of how to optimize things. Um, just real quick, I just want to take a quick second and 
see anybody in chat here? Is there anybody listening? Or am I just going to push through some of this real quick and it's not going to hurt your feelings? Have I been, I don't want to, have I been losing you guys? Have I been, there's something going on in the uh, presentation? Are you guys pretty much following along with what I've done up until this point? For you. Saw it. Maybe you just kind of zoned me out. That's fine. I'll just power through this then. Um... The way that was originally that the instructor originally tackled it is perfectly appropriate in that uh, once you come once you find two column or a row and a column that are matched as far as minimum distance is concerned, you're supposed to combine those into a new column and then update uh, the rest of the matrix based off that new value. That's all the UPGMA is. Uh, and then you just keep doing that until you end up with a matrix of just one item. So it's just a one by one. And you just recursively do that. The issue that I took with it is if, again, you're working with sufficiently large data, it's actually computationally expensive to delete and concatenate uh, rows onto a NumPy array. And this is because unlike Python, where lists are dynamic and uh, super helpful in allocating memory, the what you don't know what's going on behind the scenes is you're not guaranteed that everything in that list are next to each other in memory. Now, for computer science people, that just means what we've done is we've said ahead of time, this is how list how long our list is going to be, our array or whatever. And when we're dealing with arrays in NumPy, it says, okay, we know it's going to be this many items and we know it's going to be this kind of item. So it goes into memory and allocates all those memory right next to each other. And what happens when you delete a, uh, and Python doesn't care about that. Uh, it, it'll just say, oh, these are all part of a list, but they can be anywhere they want to be. Now there's trade-offs. That's usable. It's super usable. The issue is, is it's actually slow in lookup speeds because you're constantly hopping around in memory. Now, if you're dealing with like SSDs and stuff, it's not a really big deal. But nonetheless, uh, when you're working in the NumPy world and you're deleting columns, inserting columns, deleting rows, inserting rows, or concatenating arrays, what's essentially happening is you're making a command to NumPy to go reallocate the memory and uh, create another array of all these additional items and then delete the previous array. So it can be computationally intense. The more traditional way of tackling this problem is through object-oriented programming. Now, there are already a number of languages out there that have access to a data structure known as a tree or a node. Uh, we all know this in biology by thinking about like phylogenetics or uh, uh, phylogeny, cladograms, and uh, dendrograms like we see in a lot of heat maps and stuff. And all this is is saying at, the, at one position, like we have a root, the base position, if we're thinking like ancestry, uh, the primordial slime or whatever you want to talk about, if that's your bag. Not mine, but if that's your bag. And you go through, uh, each level that you go through means that uh, they have diverged by some amount from the previous level, and then so on and so forth. So items that are clustered together or grouped together into the same clade or uh, OTU, um, that's just an operational transition unit, operational, I don't know, OTU. Somebody in chat knows what OTU stands for. Feel free to type it in. But the idea is um, we just want to keep dividing things as they go down until we've uh, everything is in their pretty little package of how uh, of how 
uh, similar they are to things to other items. Now, <clears throat> the uh, the issue before I even get into my version of the UPGMA, which again is incomplete as of today, uh, the issue with this is is that what happens, and this has been a traditional problem with UPGMA for a long time, what happens when there's a tie? So we've already seen in this case right here where this zero, and since this is symmetric, we can just look at this one. This zero is the only zero item here. However, what if zero didn't exist in this list? What if we said argmin in this case? Yeah, I'm hoping your eyes are kind of squinting and you're going, uh, well, there's a, there's a lot of ones. Okay, so we have all these ones. That means we have a lot of ties. And this is where UPGMA does what a lot of bioinformaticists do. They just make an arbitrary decision. If I'm going to go with this one because it's sooner. Well, this means that there's a certain amount of uh, chaos involved or entropy involved. I shouldn't say involved. There's a, a certain amount of chaos involved in these matrices in that if you randomize the sequence order here, you're likely to get a different tree diagram every single time. And that's the problem I have with the wiki page for UPGMA is that uh, because the way UPGMA works, it's called a bifurcating tree or a binary tree, meaning any node in the tree can only have two children. Um, since it's like that, what happens if you have like three-way ties? If you can only have two children, uh, if you have three of them, one gets left out, so to speak. So uh, that's my only issue. I have no real solution on what to do with that unless you create a uh, node structure, a tree structure that allows an item to have multiple children, which is perfectly possible. That's called uh, ultramesticity, meticity. Anyways, so that aside, let's talk about trees for a second. Uh, a tree, if we were just looking at this, you can think of like a folder structure on your computer as a tree. So let me uh, go over to markdown mode. Uh, actually, let's go over. If I go here, let's say we're at our root folder. So I'm just going to say this is slash, right? And from slash, I have a couple of things. I have a uh, readme. I have, if I can spell that right. And if I'm like Arthur, so it says, it said, for some reason, Arthur had an Excel. Or no, wait, was, what was it? DocX. There we go. Somebody had a readme DocX in their repo, and it made me laugh so hard. Uh, you have a readme, and then we have uh, whatever, I don't know, dot .get, which is a folder, and then you would have a dot .bash rc. You have some additional stuff. And then we would have a folder that we would call um, documents or downloads. And in this folder... we would have, I don't know, um, Miniconda, uh, Cats Gone Wild, I don't know. The whole point of this is to say is when you think of this, this folder structure is just a tree structure. We're saying this is the root, and then as we grow this tree, as things get more and more pronounced, or as these folders get more and more involved, uh, you can see that there is a certain distance from this cat's gone wild all the way to the root. There is some length there, and that's called the depth of a tree. The width of a tree is if a folder has uh, multiple children, but those children are at varying levels. So this would be the first child of this. Um, I'm going to delete you. This kind of screws up my illustration. This is the first child of the root directory. These would be the grandchildren 
or the children's children of this root directory. But what if we have another folder here that we call documents? And inside that one, we have some more meme worthy stuff. Um, I don't know, Compton. From straight out of Compton. So this right here, we're talking from Cats Gone Wild to the root directory. That's the depth of the uh, of tree. Or if you were searching, this would be depth per search. You were looking, uh, you're going as deep as you can go before you start coming back. The other version of this is width or breadth. So here we're saying that documents is at the same level as uh, downloads. And then straight out of Compton is that the same level as Cats Gone Wild. So that's layers within the tree or breadth of the tree. Um, so this is something you guys are actually already familiar with and you see on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, even when you start thinking about family trees. Um, so when we do this, we can actually... Uh, we can actually leverage the object-oriented programming capabilities of, uh, of Python and create a tree structure for us. In that the terminal elements, or what we'll call the leaves of the tree, are actually just going to be the alignments themselves. Because the alignments aren't going to have children. The alignments are only going to have parents, meaning the nodes or the groups or the clades or the OTUs that they are assigned to, meaning that I am with this and this is, um, yeah. I'll get to a demonstration. Uh, actually, before I get into my bad code, let me get into good code. And we can actually see the working order of it before we move over to what I've been doing wrong on something else. Okay, so there's an additional number of libraries. Watch, this is GitHub to me. Oh, it did. There's an additional couple of libraries that we have to install to do this. So if you just, if you're working in a uh, bash system or a Linux based system, you can just type this percent percent bash and then everything in the cell will be run from the command line. So we're gonna install some things, conda install, and then install that into whatever environment you're working in. And I want you to install SciPy, uh, SciKit Bio, and um, Bio Python. Let's see if that's right. So SciPy is like the umbrella of of data science packages or computation packages in Python. So NumPy actually belongs to SciPy. Even though NumPy was around first, SciPy is the parent company, or not parent company, the parent library of NumPy. Okay. I don't care. I already have them installed. So those are the correct names. So SciPy has a lot of computational things in it uh, that are actually already available to you. So you may not think it, but a lot of what you already plan on doing as far as some fancy function that does something uh, that will uh, do some computation for you on some matrix math or whatever like that, or something that you'll be doing to a NumPy array, a lot of times that already exists in SciPy. They have lo it, it's an extremely expansive umbrella. Scikit-Bio, uh, if, if the first part of that Scikit kind of perked your attention. It's because scikit-bio is a lot like scikit-learn, where scikit-learn is for uh, 
production and education using machine learning techniques. Scikit-Bio, uh, it's fully it's fully funded and supported by NumFocus, the group that uh, does a lot of this open science, open source so software stuff. Um, it's funded. It's extremely well maintained, and their whole uh, priority with Scikit-Bio is to create educational resources for bioinformatics, so specifically training bioinformatics. And we'll use a couple of these right here in place. The last one is BioPython. And this tends to be the one-stop shop for people trying to do anything, at least genetics-related or uh, bioinformatics-related. There tends to be something in BioPython for everything. However, I've had an issue in the past where I've looked at a lot of BioPython and it gets very confusing. They have so much code base. There's so much code there. And a lot of it is very interdependent on each other. So trying to like hijack the workflow and getting in the middle of something uh, and, and taking over another operation is actually kind of a pain to some extent. I understand why they do it and they do a great job doing it. I would never dog those guys whatsoever. I'm just saying... For the purposes of me being really ad hoc about this, I'm not always all about everything in BioPython. Nonetheless, we're going to import some things to make this the working copy of this. And this is everything we did in class uh, in like 17 lines of code, not counting the inputs. So from scipy.cluster.hierarchy, yes, that is correct. SciPy has a whole hierarchy package full of a bunch of algorithms specifically designed for hierarchical clustering. We're going to import linkage. Now, what linkage is, is like a parent function that a lot we can pass any algorithm, any uh, clustering algorithm we want to it, and it'll apply it to everything it gets. The next part we're going to need is from scipy.spatial.distance import pdist. This we'll see in a second of how this works. Um, from skbio, this is the name for scikit-bio. Uh, just like scikit-learn, you import as sklearn, scikit-bio. We're going to import tree node, and this is their specific class for handling tree structures. Uh, we've already imported text distance. And then from bio, so this is the namespace of BioPython. This is how it's imported. From bio, import philo. Now, I'm going to take a brief second here. We see that uh, when we're importing from SciPy cluster hierarchy, we import linkage, and that's lowercase. And then in these last two cases where we've imported something, we've imported something, and it's been uppercase. This is a naming convention in Python as uh, with re respect to the, the Python enhancement protocol or uh, proposal, uh, PEP8, which means that defines the naming conventions that are that should be used when dealing with Python. And the naming convention is functions and methods should all be lowercase. And they prefer that they be separated by underscores and not camel case, whatever. Um, in any case, uh, classes are or objects, so to speak, the blueprints in which we create objects should be uppercase, like this, or capital case, sentence case. So here we're importing two functions, pdist and linkage, and we're importing two objects called philo and tree node. And then the last one comes directly from the uh, Python standard library uh, called stringio. Okay, so that's all our imports, and we're gonna take our alignments here and bring them down here. And we already have our IDs. So the very first thing we have to do is create this distance matrix. So I'm gonna take a little uh, different form of my distance matrix function before and we're going to change it up a little bit. So I'm going to say def ham array. And left and right, well, I'll say top and bottom. 
and then we just say return text distance dot hamming and there's just the the special thing where i'm going to say top zero and bottom zero and this means i'm indexing the first position of each of those specific items and you'll see why in a second the next part is i'm going to say def scipy uh, dist matrix and I'm going to give it this list of sequences. And I'm going to go through the alignment. So I'm going to create an array of the alignments themselves. So align equals mp.array sequences. And then dot reshape it to negative one. Okay. Let me take a second and actually show you what this does. So we already have these alignments here. Traditionally speaking, while NumPy can use string arrays or character arrays, just like you can do in Python, and that's all well and good. That's all well and good. Um, it has a hard time doing string operations, and that's kind of the ballywick of, of Python. Python does tremendous work on string operations or string comparisons. So when we put a set of strings inside of a NumPy array, just without this reshape, this is what it looks like. It's just a, an array of all of those elements and it's automatically inferred that it is a Unicode, whatever, bytecode stuff. But if we reshape it, you get that this is, instead of it being a one dimensional array, or one dimension, or just a vector of all of the sequences, we've now turned it into an n by one uh, matrix. So each row is a specific sequence. Now this is only because we need it to play well with our other function that we uh, imported, which was pdist. And what pdist does is it'll automatically uh, compute it'll automatically apply the same function to each element in there element wise. So it'll do an all versus all for us and just a single align or a single line. So here I'm just saying, I want to apply the hamming distance. So here's how I call a function. I'm just calling the function itself. I'm actually, or I'm, I'm referencing the function itself. I'm not calling it. So when you use parentheses after a function, that's when you actually are telling the function to do something. Here we're just saying, use this thing that I call ham array to do this. So what it's going to do is it's going to go through each of the items in this alignment, in this alignments list, and then apply the ham array function to each item versus each item. And because this is a this is an array of items, uh, an array of arrays, so to speak, because you see this outer array, it's an array of arrays. That's why I have to do this bracket zero here. And then once we get done with this, um, we're just going to return condensed. So let's see this in action. SciPy distance matrix, and I give it the alignments and just go to town. Well, looky there. That's the condensed form of matrix, condensed form matrix that we did up here. This is the one I did by hand, and this is the one done by SciPy. Now we could test this all we want. Let's just for the sake of having fun, let's actually time this. Let's see how fast SciPy can actually do this condensed algorithm. And you'll actually see that Python's pretty fast in some cases. And I'll do that same thing. SciPy is done. It takes microseconds for it to actually uh, do this pdist. Now, obviously, that's going to get bigger as the list gets bigger. But then when we look at the Python version of it, hey, 126 microseconds versus 147. Now, there's a lot of variance here depending on what my machine I have and everything like that. But you see that the Python form, the Python way, 
is just as fast, if not faster, than the uh, SciPy way. The only thing that you might see, actually, no, it actually does it very well as well. In any case, the Python way works perfectly fine. This is just more condensed, not as many lines to type. Okay, so now that we have our distance matrix, I'm going to say dm equals SciPy. I'll do this. dm SciPy uh, equals this distance matrix thing. Now that we have that, uh, I want to create my UPGMA tree. And I'm going to say up or up equals linkage. And this linkage function, it takes a distance matrix. So look at why. Um, stuff. Parameters y. This is the condensed distance matrix. So this linkage function requires a condensed distance matrix because it's trying to do it as uh, as optimum as optimally as possible. And we already have a condensed linkage or a condensed distance matrix. We've created two different ways by now. And then the other part that it needs is the method that's going to be used. So there's all these linkage methods, and we can go and look at them. Uh, the one that we'll be picking today is the UPGMA method, which is called average, because that's all UPGMA is. It's an unweighted pairwise. Uh, I can't think of it. I'm having a brain fart. Anyways, so here I'm just going to pass it that DM SciPy, and I'm going to pass this uh, the string average. And the reason I'm using a string, I could use a function if I wanted to, so long as my function knows what to do. Um, but SciPy already has these clustering algorithms written in there, and they gave it a special name called average. And there's a couple of different ones out there for it. Uh, you can probably look it up. Let's, let's pull up SciPy. SciPy. And I'll just show you. chat this is the what i just posted in chat is the linked document and this is saying uh, if you look at that link we have a bunch of different algorithms out there uh like single um so this is uh perform single min nearest linkage or complete so max furthest point average which is upgma uh, weighted, which is WPGMA, centroid, which is UPGMC, median, WPGMC, and the perform wards linkage. There's a lot of different uh, clustering algorithms, and SciPy already has them. So UPGMA is under this name, average. So I just do that, and hey, it worked perfectly fine, okay? The next part is we need to put this into a tree, and this is when we use tree node. And then from, we're gonna use a specific from linkage matrix. And here we're just saying from this linkage matrix, I've already created, see? We already have something from a link, linkage matrix. That's all up is if we look, if we wanna look at it. This is the linkage matrix. There's a lot of stuff in here that, uh, that we could look at, right? This looks like just a plain array, but this gives us all the information that we need as far as the linkage matrix is concerned. Well, tree node, they have a method that is meant to parse these linkage matrices on them on their own. So I can just give it this UP. And then the second portion that this needs is because we can't just give it a bunch of numbers. It needs some way to identify the elements. And that's why we did those IDs in the very beginning. So here is the IDs. And if we do this, ow, okay. It's going to give us some information like the tip count, the tip count or the leaves is the number of alignments. Because remember, the leaves aren't nodes. The leaves are the terminal elements, so to speak. Um, so the we have five elements and then we see this node count. This is saying how many OTUs or blades or groups of alignments there are. That's what this prints out. Not super informative, just telling us that it has a tree structure. However, I can do that. I turned it into its string form. 
if anybody knows this, I hope you put it out in chat, or maybe it makes a little bit of correlation with what's going, or makes a little bit of sense with respect to what we did in class. This is the Newick style notation of a tree. That's it. It's already done all of it for us. I already have that Newick style uh, notation. So I have the Newick style. Now I just need to have something that can actually handle the Newick style and not have to figure out how to do this myself. So this is where I'm going to use Philo. Philo is part of the BioPython library and it's meant to handle phylogenetics. Well, this is where, for the very first time, I'm going to be jumping in or cutting in the regular phylogenetics workflow, and I'm gonna go directly from that uh, new string. So I'm just gonna say string tree here, and I want to strip it, just because I don't need this, this uh, new line here at the end. And um, I just have to tell it what kind of form it is, and I'm just going to say, so it'll create this dendrogram for me. Again, this won't be super helpful. Just tells us some information. It's rooted, false, weight, one, whatever. Not super helpful. However, Philo does expose to us a function called draw, and then I just give it this dendrogram. Give it a second. I need to do a matplotlib in, in line. So here is our UPGMA clustered dendrogram. And here we're seeing that those two items, those that dash uh, slash one slash two, are identical to each other, so they're in the same clade. And then, so that's one clade, so this would be the one node. And then we have another node here because they're just, they're closer to this one. And then we have another node here because these ones are separate or the furthest from the other groups. So the way the UPGMA works is it looks for the minimum, uh, minimum similarities between them and then groups them into a group, into one unit. And then from that new unit, it compare, it recalculates the distance matrix, treating that one unit as a single unit. So then it compares uh, this, this uh, I'm gonna say this taxa, taxa one against taxa two and taxa three, and then taxa uh, four against taxa two and three, and then taxa five versus taxa two and three. It starts treating those as an, an individual unit. And since you consider it like an individual unit, it's just like the communicative property or associative property. Communicative. I can't. Um, it's the idea of when I say uh, six times, and then I can say A plus B, right? Or uh, six times, there we go. Six times six times six. Well, this six times this six, or this times five. Six times four and six times five is the same thing as four times five, whatever. I'm not going to go into it. No big deal. So it looks for similarities, groups them together, repopulates that distance matrix, but now it has one less column and one less row because it's deleted in the place of two, it's created one new column. And then it does it again and groups the next group. So these were grouped together. So then if you're thinking again in the square form matrix, instead of having three rows, we now just have one row. And instead of having three columns, we have one column because it's square. And then we keep doing that until everything ends up being grouped together all into one big group, one big chunk. And that's what this is, uh, what's happening. Okay. Now... Now that you see the working copy of it, I'm gonna show you what my first approach was it. And I started getting making things a little bit more complicated than they need. Um, the first thing I'm gonna be doing is um, I want to create uh, unique identifiers for nodes. So these nodes right here in the middle uh, where these clades are defined, because I already have identifiers for the leaves, but I don't have identifiers for these nodes. So to do that, just real easy to make sure that I'm always going to end up with some random 
uh, identifier, I tend to always end up going to the UD ID for function. The next part is from iter tools, import product. Can't remember why I did this. Oh well. From collections dot abc. So these are the abstract base classes. If you don't know about these, it's you're not missing out on anything. This is really uh I'm not gonna say advanced, uh esoteric. But the idea is instead of checking if I'm gonna check if something is a list or an iteratable or a string or an array, instead of checking against all those types, I can check against a specific uh, specific base class. And all of those things, all those things have the same thing in common, and that is that they are all iteratable. So all I'm checking to see is if they are all iteratable. Once I have this, I start doing my object-oriented programming. And I'm gonna say class equals node, and def init self label equals none, uh, data equals none, left equals none. Lastly, Uh, we're going to define some private variables just because uh, this class will get angry if we don't. Self left underscore left equals self dot underscore right equals self dot underscore parent equals none. We're not going to be really touching those directly right now. So self dot has children equals false self dot label so that's the instantiation or the initialization uh, the next step is how do we actually start defining these? Let's get into our object oriented programming where I'm saying at property def right self and return self dot underscore right. So this is the idea of encapsulation. I'm having some middleman in the middle. So, uh, Akayan Chu, yeah, Angel, uh, says, so I'm wondering if there are various ways to construct a phylogenetic tree. This method is comparing similarities while some other trees could compare the difference between their gene sequence, meaning that the more difference the sequences have, the further their nodes become. Uh, essentially, that's just two sides of the same coin. Uh, since we're comparing similarities we're also comparing dissimilarities uh so we're grouping things that are most similar to each other close to each other and the least similar that they are the further they get so that's essentially the same thing you're talking about but opposite um because a dissimilarity score is essentially what we're already doing so we keep I think we keep on saying we're, we're putting things that are similar to each other, but if you remember the distance matrix that we computed is uh, a, a matrix filled with how dissimilar those alignments are from one another. Because we counted up how different they were from each other. So uh, in doing that, we're essentially doing what you're saying right here. We're counting the differences and then grouping the things that are the least different from each other together closely. Does that make sense? Meaning that the more difference the sequences have, the way they're known. Yeah. And that's what this does. Uh, this branch length, this branch length is actually uh, what is indicative of how different something is from something else. Uh, and that's what this branch, yeah, that's what this branch link 
the case, how different they are from each other. Additionally, when they're broken into different clades, they're all the same, uh, or they're they're more similar to each other. So this clade is obviously more similar than the, than the, these items, but these this clade is more similar to each other than these two are. That's all it's saying. I'm not going to be. Um, I'm going to finish the uh, right and left. I'm just going to copy and paste this so that I don't have to type it out. So the idea here is in this bifurcated tree, every node has two children, a left child and a right child. However, the children themselves never end up having children, and that's why I have this had has children flag. So if it has children, then it cannot be a terminal node. It cannot be a leaf. Um, because we can't base it off of whether or not it has a parent. So these sequences right here, these two that are identical, they have the same parent node. That's this node right here. And this node has a parent, which is right here, and then this node has a root, right? Everything in here has a parent except the root. However, not everything here has a child. So the way we do this is I just keep this has child or has children um, equal to false. And if we assign a child to it, then we can turn this into uh, from being a node into being a leaf or vice versa. So when we assign something to be a child, we need to check to make sure that we're giving them either none, so the person's making the right child be none, or it's going to be a node type object, this thing. Um, otherwise, if it's none, just don't worry about it. Uh, this self-right, I mean, if it's already, if it's not none, meaning we're trying to assign something to this node when something already exists. This is when we're saying that binary trees can only have two children. Well, if you ask yourself real quick, if all I'm checking for is right, I haven't checked for left yet. Okay? Well, that's my decision as an uh, just really arbitrary decision where I am saying uh, I'm going to defer that my initial reaction for assigning children to these nodes is going to be is going to say, hang on, copy that, left. I'm going to say I want left to be assigned first. So here it's saying if somebody tries to assign to left, it's going to check to see if left is none. And if left is not none, then it's going to go see if there's something in right. And if right is not none, it's going to yell at you. Otherwise, if there is nothing in right, but there is something in left, it'll automatically say, uh, I'm gonna create, I'm gonna tag this new child as having the parent being myself, and then I'm gonna assign it to the right node or the right child. So here I'm saying everything's gonna go left, and if left's already taken, it goes right, and if right's already taken, then you're trying to add too many things to this tree, okay? And then if we give it any children, if there's anything assigned to left, then this item, this self, now has children. And I set child, has children to true. The same thing down here with right. Um, this is just a redundancy in place to make sure that if somebody goes against the grain and assigns to right instead of left, uh, it still tracks whether or not that child is uh, seen and not. The next one is a label. And labels are important. I'll talk about my little thing here real quick. But labels are important when we're doing these dendrograms in that they have to be unique. Or I guess they don't technically have to be unique, but the way that Philo works, the way that this tree node works from linkage matrix, it expects unique IDs. Um, so it makes sense that our nodes, our leaves, should have IDs. Well, any of our leaves, any of these terminal nodes, are, their IDs are just going to be the sequence that we're giving it, or whatever name we give it, or identifier. However, these nodes right here, the middle, the, the, the parent node that are actually splitting up these clades, 
the ones that actually have children, uh, they don't technically have names. So in that case, I'm saying if they don't have a name, I'm assigning this UUID4. So to see this in action, uh, UUID4 from the UUID library uh, creates a unique identifier specific to this element or specific to your your uh, your instantiation. So every time I change this, it's actually going it's guaranteed to be unique every single time. What's more is that this is a specific class or, or this is a specific type of object. So I'm gonna say p equals this. And now I can say uh, is instance p a UUID. So I don't have you. Uh, from UUID. And now I say, is it an actual UUID? And why this is important is what would be the difference between this identifier and our really, really long identifier, this. If you just look at it, your gut check is saying, uh, well, they're both strings. How would you tell the difference between this being a string and this being a string? Well, that's what's special is UUID is a special type of class, so we can actually check to see if the identifier for that class is a UUID. And if it is, then it cannot be a leaf. It cannot be the very bottom of the tree, top of the tree. So here we're saying in this, I'm saying, if it doesn't have a label, uh, generate a label. And then if the person gave us a string, just assign that label directly to the label attribute. If they gave us a list or tuple, and this is the case where I could say list or tuple, or I can say iteratable. If it's iteratable, and that first item of it is a string, then just join everything and turn it into one giant string. So this is in the case of somebody giving us, like we already have alignments, and then we have alignment zero. That's that first alignment. But what happens if I were to do um, this? Like we saw, we see a lot of people do when they try to do for loops. It breaks that string up into a list. Well, I can iterate, I can say for letter in alignments zero, print letter. I can iterate through a string just as well as I can iterate through a list. But what's better about that is our strings are immutable objects, meaning they're guaranteed to be that same size. And if the user tries to change that, it's going to yell at them. A list is, uh, is mutable, meaning I can change any element in there. And there's the possibility that the user at the end could break what I'm trying to do. I don't want to do that. I don't want to give them that kind of control. So I'm converting their labels into strings automatically. The last part is the data and setting the uh, has parents. So the data property, the idea of the data property is, or the data attribute is what is its distance. Again, we were already we're thinking about this distance matrix. And each of these can have its own specific distance to include each of these nodes. Because once these once these two items get grouped together, they get grouped together as this single node. And yes, after the next iteration, they have to uh, get the distance, everything has to get the distance relative to each of them. But from there on out, you can treat this node as the uh, acting agent for both of these. So then this node actually has a distance element, so to speak. And then you compare everything against that. And then you do it again and again and again and again. So that's what this data is, is whatever the payload is we want on it, whatever data we want to shove inside those trees. And in this case, it would be distance. The last one is the parent. And the parent is just so that we can say, uh, is it pointing where is it going to? And so this is so you can traverse a tree. So if you start at this root, I can recursively say from this, I wanna to go to the next 
a node. And from this one, if it has a child, go to the next node. Okay, that's terminal. It doesn't have any children. Okay, then I'm going to want to go to this one. Oh, it has children. Okay, now I'm at these terminal ones. So it just keeps on going recursively. If there is children, keep going. Um, now, I was having the darndest time in this trying to get my iterator to work, and the idea is I want to be able to get the length of the item, and I don't know why it wasn't working. Um, but in Python, objects have a method, a special method, called def iter. And this is what happens when you say for i n. This is the what governs the behavior of how your program works when you do these iterations on it. So I'm going to say uh, for i in, well, I'll say l equals self.child if l. This means if it doesn't have, or if it has a child, uh, for child in uh, self.child, or self.left, self.left, for each of the children in self.left, yield the child. And then once I'm done with that, uh, I want to catch a specific case of none. The other one is uh, r, oops, r equals self dot right if r for child in self dot right yield right yield child there we go else. Uh, pass. So there's a number of different ways that we can look at this. And the idea is I'm saying when I'm iterating through this, I want to check the left one because I'm assuming that I'm always going to have a child on the left side if I have any child, children at all. So I'm going to have this child on the left. I'm going to take that child. And if it, if it so happens, so here it is. If I'm iterating through this from the very top and I'm at this node and I'm going to say, I want to keep going. I want to get the children of this node. It would look to see if there's a child on the left, and it does have one. So then it'll go here, and if this item has a child, it'll keep going. It'll keep digging, just like right here. This one has a child, but this is not a terminal node, so it'll keep going until it returns this one. That's what the idea of this function is. Um, so here it's saying uh, just yield all the children. I can't get this to work for some reason. I don't know. Couldn't figure it out. So the if I'm creating a tree just from scratch, it's this node. So this would be my root node. And then my root node has some data, 17. And I'm not giving it a label, so it's going to create a label for itself. I'm setting the left child equal to this other node called B, which has a distance or whatever data I have for 12. And then it has a child that is automatically going to be assigned to the left uh, of D with a value of 18. Well, that was the left child of this node. Well, now the right child is this C. So I can do this. The problem is I was having a hard time with iterating through it. So I should be able to say for child in A, print child.label. And it's not returning anything. And I, I've tried a, a couple of different iterations of this and finally I just got tired trying to figure out different things. So here it's iterating through them and it seems to be working fine, but it's not printing out B. It's saying it has the child, but it's not uh, 
giving me the child at the end. I guess I could say... Actually, that makes sense. Never mind. Um, the point of this function is for me to get all of the children, so all of the terminal leaves. And um, the only terminal leaves in here are C, because it has no children, and D, because it has no children. So I should be able to say this to get the length of a tree. I'm going to define len, and this is what happens when I call len on a function or on an object. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through this iteration, and I'm just going to count up all of the uh, times a child is seen. And if this works, I should be able to uh, count the number of children this specific node has. So I actually got it to work finally. Yay. OK, so the other part of this, uh, I'm actually just going to point you guys to the helpful link that I was kind of mirroring some of my stuff off of. This is an implementation that uses this. This is probably one of the more optimal ways in the chat. I just put a link up there. This is one of the more optimal ways for uh, using a tree structure to do your UPGMA instead of creating multiple variations of the uh, NumPy array, which could be potentially expensive. Um, hopefully this was helpful. I'm absolutely drained. Uh, the past couple days have been really, really fun. Oh, I'm doing I'm not going. Are you guys seeing my chat screen? There we go. There's my chat screen. All right, so I'm spent. I'm done. I, I hope some of this stuff was helpful to you. Uh, please let me know right now in the chat if any of this was, if you have any specific questions, I'd be glad to cover what I can. Uh, Other than that, I I feel like I kind of let you guys down because I didn't get through the full implement implementation myself. Maybe it just needed, my computer needed a restart. It's now finally the iteration is working. Um, in any case, uh, feel free to send me a tweet. Uh, uh, my Twitter is better underscore idiot. If you uh, feel like having... Uh, a more formal conversation about it, you can feel free to go to the GitHub repo for the office hours and just post a discussion there or post an issue, just a whatever. Feel free to drop me a line. Uh, you guys also have my email, those of you that were in the that are in Bioinformatics 520. And feel free to share this. Actually, I strongly encourage you to share this with other people. Maybe not this video because it was kind of harebrained, but Share this with other people and uh, really get the, get the information out about this kind of resource, the resource that I've been putting together in making this channel. Uh, I'd like to see it grow because I really, really love teaching this kind of material. Uh, so please share it, retweet, uh, forward it to all your friends, newsletters, church groups. I don't care. I want people to know. It's super helpful. I don't get anything from this. There is no money changing hands. Um, if you're on YouTube, go ahead and drop me a subscribe. Click the bell icon for notifications of when new videos are posted. If you're on Twitter, press the heart slash follow icon, uh, or not Twitter, uh, Twitch, and you'll get notifications when I get li go live. And the same thing with Twitter. Go ahead and click follow to get those notifications of when as well. Uh, hopefully you guys have found this material somewhat helpful. Other than that, I hope you have a good day, a good weekend, and those of you in 529, I'll see you after spring break. Thank you.